Maybe you knew this already, but Life is Strange is a weird-ass video game. One that is, by turns, a nakedly honest point-and-clicker about teen girls and a psychosexual freakout on the nature of choice. And it doesn't exactly marry these two themes painlessly, and I'm frankly unconvinced it's trying to. Mechanically, Life is Strange, a game by Don't Nod, is a mostly faithful iteration on the Telltale adventure game model. A lot of mid-90s LucasArts design, several recent innovations, and a heaping dose of heavy rain. Like a Telltale game, you navigate a 3D world and interact with your environment using context-sensitive button presses. And like a Telltale game, play consists of simple adventure game puzzles, plot branching decisions, and a whole lot of dialogue. Like a Telltale game, it's released in five episodes where choices you make in one will alter the contents of episodes down the line, and it has the same notifications that your choices will have consequences, the same frequent autosave to keep you from replaying too much of the game, and the same breakdown at the end of an episode that compares your choices with the choices of other players. But one hallmark of a Telltale game that is conspicuously absent is the thing that makes Telltale's choices so meaningful. The timer. A timer at the bottom of your screen ticking down every time you make a decision enforces a particular type of play. See, Telltale doesn't want you to deliberate on your choices. Telltale wants you to act on your gut, which sometimes means making a choice you come to regret and having to live with it for the rest of the game. Don't even think about it. You just couldn't keep your fucking mouth shut, could you? Had to tell her everything. But in Life is Strange, players are given the ability to rewind time, letting them see all results of just about every choice, every puzzle, every line of dialogue before making up their minds and proceeding. So players can deliberate forever. So if you were to keep two saves going so that you could see all outcomes of your choices, that would be playing against Telltale's design philosophy, which is about living with your decisions. But here, save scumming is a core mechanic. Now, I don't know what the developer's thought process was, but I like to imagine them coming up with this idea and then asking, okay, say a person could actually do this, could see every possible future stemming from their actions and pick the one they think is best. What would the logical end point of that story be? <laughs> okay. Okay. Alright. The plot mechanics of Life is Strange are fucking bizarre. It is, in essence, two entirely different stories rolled up in the same package. These two stories contain all the same characters and all the same plot points, but exist in wildly different genres and have wildly different themes. For the first, Two and a half ish episodes, you appear to be playing a tender coming of age story, while the second two and a half ish are a Lynchian psychodrama that seems designed with the express purpose of complicating, then rejecting, and ultimately attempting to devour the coming of age story and erase all records of its existence. And then, in a truly bugfuck climax, the game point blank asks you, the player, which of these two stories you want an ending to. Chloe! I can't make this choice! No, Max. You're the only one who can. Why don't we start at the beginning? Max Caulfield is a student at the prestigious Blackwell Academy in her hometown of Arcadia Bay, Oregon. Like a lot of people her age, she's a little awkward, a little shy. She's on her own for the first time. Several years earlier, she and her family moved to Seattle, and her parents are still there while she's moved into the Blackwell dorms. Max hasn't maintained any of her local friendships, and while she gets along with everyone who doesn't actively hate her, she doesn't have a group or any close friends, except maybe the boy who has a crush on her. She's also devoted to photography, it's what she's here to study, and greatly admires her photography teacher, but she's too nervous to submit her work to the big photo competition despite her teacher's encouragement. One day, after an intense vision in her photo class, Max bears witness to the school bully pulling a gun and shooting a girl in the bathroom. And in that moment, she, as if by instinct, discovers that she can reverse time by up to a minute or two. After a bit of trial and error, she manages to prevent the girl's death, and, that strangeness aside, she steps back into her normal life with these newfound abilities. This is the setup for a very particular genre of story, albeit one with a more fantastical bent than usual. This genre has a name, but I'm only gonna say it once, because it's long and German, and when Americans start dropping long German words into their sentences, they come off as seriously pretentious, and even I have limits. But the word is 
Bildungsroman. Now, English speakers often use this term interchangeably with coming-of-age story, but it's actually a specific genre with specific themes. The novel most often referenced as the first story of this kind is Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship, and other notable examples include Jane Eyre, The Glass Bead Game, and A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Classically, these are stories about indecision, about a youth pulled in many directions trying to decide what kind of adult they're going to be. The tension isn't between protagonist and antagonist. Traditionally, there is no real antagonist, but between protagonist and society. The adult world has expectations of the main character, and that character needs to decide to what extent, as a grown-up, they want to satisfy those expectations, and to what extent they want to pursue their own happiness. The usual emotional arc of such a story, is accepting that maturity means taking on the world's demands, shouldering your share of society's burdens, and learning to fit your happiness around that responsibility. Wilhelm Meister leaves the theater to become a doctor, Jane Eyre marries but on her own terms, Joseph Necht leaves Castalia to become a teacher in the larger world, though sometimes the battle between personal happiness and social responsibility is not resolved simply. The early going of Life is Strange fits snugly into the genre. There are even subgenres that are coming into one's own as a student and coming into one's own as an artist, which revolve around mentor characters, so you can tick those off the list as well. After discovering her powers, Max runs into the girl from the bathroom in the parking lot and realizes it's her best friend from childhood, Chloe, and the two become nearly inseparable. When Max reveals her abilities, Chloe enlists her in the hunt for Rachel Amber, a friend of hers who vanished recently. And what follows is less a traditional plot than, typical of the genre, a string of vignettes, this one loosely structured around a search for the missing girl. These various episodes give Max many windows into the lives she could lead. Stick it to the mean girl, or turn the other cheek. Down-to-earth boyfriend, or maybe unpredictable girlfriend. Reach out to the girl being mistreated by a security guard, or take a photo for art. These are all hallmarks of the genre. Questions of ethics, the wholesome love versus the wild love, dedication to others versus dedication to art. You might think the ability to call do-over on any decision would make these choices easier, but you'd be wrong. Time travel makes them all harder. Dedicating yourself to photography means breaking a hurting girl's heart. Kissing the wild love means devastating the wholesome love. At one point, Max changes history so dramatically that she actually visits an alternate timeline where she's popular with the girls who had previously mistreated her, but isn't friends with Chloe at all. This only drives home that no matter what life she leads, there will be a cost. She can't have everything. There is no right answer. No matter what she chooses, she's doing wrong by someone. This sets up the classic arc where she's going to have to make some big decisions about what maturity means to her, and those decisions will involve sacrifices. At least that's how it works on paper. In practice, the game only sometimes strikes that balance where all options have merits and drawbacks and no one is empirically better than the others. More often, it's like... Okay, you're trying to get into this RV, but there's an angry dog inside. Do you distract the dog by throwing a bone into the parking lot? Or kill the dog by throwing the bone into traffic? And that's a fake choice. No one kills the dog. Why would you kill the dog? And then there's the small mercies, like keeping someone from getting splashed by muddy water, which, okay, that isn't a sacrifice. There's no reason not to do that. So let's say the time travel works as an imperfect metaphor for youthful indecision. And what pleasures can be drawn from this section of the game are to do with how much you enjoy earnestness. There's a commitment by the designers to tackle subjects that are very uncommon to video games, from teen suicide to euthanasia to budding queer romance. And it's hard not to respect their willingness to, well, go there. Real effort has been put into addressing these subjects seriously, and these sequences can be very affecting, even as none of them entirely hit the mark. The scene where you talk a suicidal Kate off a rooftop, for all its intensity, is, mechanically, Kate quizzing you on how much flavor text you read in her room earlier. The sequence where alt-universe Chloe wants to die takes great pains not to be ableist towards paraplegics, while still being kind of ableist towards paraplegics. And the budding queer romance often seems about two sentences away from turning into a late-night Showtime erotic drama that is obviously written by middle-aged men. But I want to be clear, it's not crass. The game wears its heart on its sleeve, and the writers clearly mean everything they say, even when they don't entirely know what they're talking about. And if you can appreciate sincerity even as you acknowledge its failings, then you can appreciate the game for what it is. It's 
like Max. Awkward, but well-meaning. Naive. Possessing a good heart, and still kinda ignorant. And that's Life is Strange. Until the second half of the game happens. I loved her so much! How can she be dead? What kind of world does this? In this story, time-traveling teenager Max Caulfield and her best friend Chloe Price, hot on the trail of the missing girl Rachel Amber, discover that her story was not a tragic one of a wayward youth getting in over her head with a drug dealer boyfriend, but one in which she was sedated, photographed, and murdered in an underground facility straight out of the girl with the dragon tattoo. In trying to track down the boy they think is responsible, Max suddenly drops to the ground with a needle in her neck and watches helplessly as her best friend dies from a bullet to the head then wakes up tied to a chair by the real killer, her photography professor, Mr. Jefferson. This is a story about regret, choice, and loyalty, full of serial killer monologues and hallucinatory imagery. A story where people look in the sky and see the moon doubled and the beach fills with the bodies of dead whales. After two and a half episodes of vignettes, Life is Strange has decided it has an honest-to-goodness plot. One that bears a striking resemblance to... Well, the designers want me to say Twin Peaks, but honestly, the greater debt it owes is to Donnie Darko. Max is guided by an animal figure only she can see, and who is probably the spirit of a dead character. Chloe is a teenager who's only alive due to the interventions of a time traveler, and this is causing a number of supernatural events to occur. Just before the climax, our hero is up on a hill coming to a difficult conclusion after watching her girlfriend die as a curious weather pattern descends on the town below. Chloe realizes that maybe the only way to set things right is to go back in time and die like she was originally fated to, and then none of this awfulness will have ever happened. And multiple episodes end with tracking shots of all the major characters montage together while melancholy pop music plays underneath. As you can imagine, going from Jane Eyre to Donnie Darko is a bit of a tonal shift. In fairness, the game does set all these threads up in the first half, and it's not like the coming-of-age story disappears. The euthanasia subplot actually happens past the midpoint. It's just that things that used to be background texture have become subjects in their own right, and they make the coming-of-age story look pretty out of place. Like, the love triangle between Chloe, Max, and Warren made sense in a coming-of-age story, but it's just ridiculous when your relationship with Chloe is tearing apart the fabric of reality, and Warren is just a dude. In this story, the antagonist is not society, but the very literal villain you thought was the mentor figure. The narrative tension is not about Max finding herself, but about fixing mistakes and hopefully not getting murdered in the process. Chloe is not a wild love, but the possible instigator of the apocalypse, and Max's powers are not a metaphor for indecision, but a pointed meditation on what it means to be a protagonist. But more on that in a minute. This half also has some ideas about choice that complicate what choice meant in the first half. There's a scene where you try to get information from Rachel Amber's ex-boyfriend, and thanks to Max's powers, you can see it play out a lot of different ways. But you start to realize that possibly the only way that nobody gets hurt is if you killed the dog earlier in the game. Four episodes in, and Life is Strange decides it actually is a game about living with decisions you can't undo. So when I started this video talking about Telltale, that wasn't just an easy point of reference. What originally seemed like an interesting take on the Telltale model now seems as though it has a bone to pick with games of that type. The complaint so often lobbied against Telltale is that it promises your choices will have significant impact on the story. Lots of people criticize them for not delivering on that promise, but Life is Strange seems to criticize Telltale for having made the promise in the first place. Why, the game asks, should you even want that responsibility? I mean, let's look at how Max escapes Mr. Jefferson's studio. Earlier in the game, Max discovers that she can travel to any point in the past that is captured in a photograph. So through the photos Jefferson has on hand, she starts leaping back to different points in the game's continuity, adjusting her decisions, trying to tweak the timeline, undo mistakes. She's looking for a scenario where she is free, Chloe is alive, and, if at all possible, no tornado is bearing down to wipe Arcadia Bay off the map, in case you forgot that's a thing that's happening. As when she first used her powers to save Chloe, it takes some trial and error, but she pulls it off. Mr. Jefferson's in jail, Chloe is safe, and, hey, she even got her photo in that competition, and what do you know, she won. 
Instead of tied up in a murderer's photography studio, she's in San Francisco with a new and better mentor figure, and her art is up on the wall, and she's the toast of the show. This is a hyper-idealized ending to the coming-of-age story. After making up her mind and taking decisive action, Max has come into her own as a student, an artist, and a young woman. You did it, Max. You're a real artist. At least, for today. And then she checks in on Chloe. What? Oh no. Chloe, where are you? I'm so fucking scared. I'm, I'm by the beach. I'm Chloe! Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Stories about teenagers who develop superhuman abilities often frame themselves as coming-of-age stories. It's not a coincidence how many fall back on the old puberty metaphor. Even without time travel or gamma rays, growing up means gaining power and independence one didn't have as a child. So everyone is expected to learn... Let's all say it together now. With great power comes great responsibility. But however much superpowers serve as symbols for growing up, they are also wish fulfillment. Like, we may agree that Peter Parker should use his newfound strength with discretion, but it still feels good to watch him beat up the bully. And we may be saddened by Uncle Ben's death, but we're still glad it turns Peter into Spider-Man because that's what we're here to see. And that's a tension endemic to the genre, that on the one hand, power is dangerous and must be used sparingly. And on the other hand, power is awesome. And we pay money to see characters wield it. And law and order, good and evil, life and death are all present not as subjects deserving of their own films, but as an excuse for centering a protagonist in an interesting story, compelling him to use his awesome powers, and teaching a boy how to be a man. This tension is at the heart of Telltale games as well, and most games in that model. They may present as being about futility, about being a minuscule player in an enormous losing game, but the plot still bends over backwards to ensure the most dramatic and impactful decisions rest on the protagonist's shoulders. And however terrible that responsibility is implied to be, players play because they want to make those decisions, and players complain when those decisions are not impactful enough. In Life is Strange, Max comes to realize that all the bizarre occurrences, the moons, the whales, the tornado, have been caused by her leaping through time. That she can't set things right, because trying to set things right has and will only ever make things worse. Chloe, I, I can't keep fixing everything if all I'm gonna do is just break it over and over again. I know how this is gonna turn out, and I'm afraid I'm fucking up all these alternate realities. The museum in San Francisco isn't just a false ending. It's an evisceration of the game you thought you were playing for the first two and a half episodes. Max gives up her perfect ending and goes back to the studio in one last effort to save Chloe, while the game stares the player down and says, How dare you think this was a coming-of-age story? How dare you think time travel was a neat way to work through your indecision? How could you think a power like this could ever be used responsibly? How could you think the consequences for your mistakes would be borne by you and you alone? This sets up an arc where Max will have to do what superhero movies almost never do. Truly reckon with how dangerous real power can be. This point gets hammered for the rest of episode 5. I got rescued by Chloe's stepdad, and when he learned Chloe was dead, he killed Mr. Jefferson, and the game was like, hey, do you want to go back and change that? And I was like, I don't know anymore. I, I could, but will changing things just make them go even more wrong? And when I go back and save Chloe, will any of this have even happened? And fuck, there's a tornado gonna come kill all of us anyway, so is there any scenario where this choice even matters? And then, above ground, the game still let me perform those small mercies, but, like, great, you're welcome. Hope you enjoy the five minutes I just added to your life, because you're still gonna die, and it's all my fault. But I want my girlfriend back, so I'm gonna jump back one more time and make things just a little bit worse. So even when you do get Chloe back, the game has made you aware of the horrible cost your entire community will pay for you having used your powers to save her again and again and again. Your only goal has been to fix your mistakes, and you're being punished for having even tried. The game deposits you up on a hill as hell descends on the town below, and then tells you, in so many words, this is the price you paid for your friend. And then it asks, 
Would you like a refund? Seeing what's happened to Arcadia Bay, Chloe says that if there's a chance it will undo everything that's occurred, she wants you to go back in time to the bathroom and let her die. Maybe that's just the way fate wanted things to happen, and it's up to you to grant or deny her wish. This final decision is the game offering you two very appropriate endings for the two very different games you've been playing. Per the themes of the coming-of-age story of the Germanic persuasion, Max's arc is learning to sacrifice for the greater good. She can't have it all, she can't satisfy everyone, and sometimes doing right by your society means giving up something you love. In the battle between personal happiness and responsibility, responsibility wins. Sometimes the wild love is someone you have to let go of, be grateful for your time together, and kiss her goodbye. She knows what's right. It's better this way. Per the themes of the Lynchian psychodrama, have you fucking lost it? What about the last 12 odd hours of gameplay in which trying to change the past universally makes the present worse gave you the idea that going back one more time could possibly fix anything? Have you learned nothing? Yes, you fucked up. And all of this is your fault. But in real life, people have to live with their fuck-ups, even the big ones. No one has the right to change history. You can't keep trying to control this. You have to let go. That's about as incompatible as two endings can be. In one, all the themes of the first half of the game are thrown in a lake and Max never finds her place in society because society gets eaten by a tornado. And in the other, the whole psychodrama plotline and all its attendant themes are literally erased from history. Whichever you pick, whichever plot you decide is the right one, a sizable portion of the game will be rendered meaningless. And we should acknowledge that these two themes, sacrifice for the greater good and learn to live with your mistakes, are not in real life things we get to choose between. Maturity means doing both. If you elect to keep Chloe alive, Max and Chloe wordlessly drive out of town. And maybe that's meant to be an unresolved ending that sticks with you for a while. I don't know, T2 meets Thelma and Louise. And that might be a pretty bold decision if the game didn't autosave right before the one choice you can't make twice. Which means everyone is just going to reload five minutes after they finish and watch the other ending, which is just... is just in all conceivable ways better. The ending where Chloe dies is longer, it has proper closure, there's this funeral scene that is so cathartic that it doesn't even make sense. You two never even met Chloe in this timeline, what are you doing here? And it confirms that, yeah, you didn't have to live with your mistakes, going back would have fixed everything. Worse, it boils the ending choice down to who do you love more, Chloe or everyone else? The reason fans have dubbed the ending Bay or Bay. But whether or not you love Chloe the mostest isn't really what all that stuff about fucking up the timeline was getting at. If ever a game needed to pull a swapper and erase your save after you make the final decision, this was it. And that's how Life is Strange ends. <laughs> I honestly can't tell you if this game is good. I can't even tell you if I liked it. But I think... I think I loved it? I mean, that last decision is kind of bullshit. But I got real choked up making it. And now we've got word that both a sequel and a prequel are in the works, and honestly, I'm apprehensive. There's a certain power to starting with one emotionally resonant genre and then ramming it headlong into a more ambitious, weirder, darker genre. And that's a move that only works when you're not expecting it. Do I want to critique how effectively Life is Strange goes off the rails when once I was dumbfounded that it did at all? Life is Strange was like nothing I'd ever played, for good and for ill. A sequel will be like at least one thing I've played already. And I don't even know if I should like this game. When people talk shit on it, I don't even disagree. And yet, here we are. Fuck it. I don't even know. Life is Strange, everyone. Wowzer.